Welcome everyone. It's good to see that so many of you have registered and are showing interest for our threat modeling training today. Uh, I hope you all are doing well. And before we start the presentation, some things I would like to share what we have been doing within the hardware.io team. Uh, we have now two weeks left for our upcoming Germany training and one of our training is already sold out. So just in case you are planning to attend any of our other trainings, please sign up uh, as soon as possible. And the, until the seats are available, we will keep the training open. In the meantime, we have also announced our CFP open for Hardware USA edition, which is scheduled in the month of July. If you are interested, please submit your research paper. We are welcoming all the researchers uh, on tools, techniques, countermeasures that you have been working on. And later this week, we will also open the registration for the conference. So stay tuned uh, and follow us on our social media. We will be also posting some interesting blogs uh, about our registration format for the Hardware USA conference. Let's begin the webinar then. Today we have Sebastian with us, who is the co-founder of Torian and an essential part of the OWASP Foundation Board. He was one of the key leaders and uh, for starting the Belgium OWASP chapter. Sebastian, on the behalf of Hardware.io team, we would also want to congratulate you today for onboarding a new CEO. And now you can focus as the CTO, 100% doing the technical work for Torian. Congratulations. Thank you. Friends, in today's webinar, Sebastian will explain threat modeling as a mandatory technique for medical device manufacturers to proactively demonstrate secure design and operations for medical devices. He will approach by discussing various practical, practical use cases, also demonstrating a practical threat modeling covering all different stages on a CT scan uh, developed in hospitals connected via a DICOM network. Uh, the presentation will be for 30 minutes, followed by which we will open for Q&A. So if you have any questions, please send them across via the Zoom chat. I will be moderating them. And after Sebastian finishes his presentation, we will open uh, the round for question and answers. Now, I would like to invite Sebastian to begin his presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you for, uh, for inviting me for uh, this webinar. Um, I think it's a, it's a great honor to be here. Let me share my screen so that you all can see what we're doing here. All right. So if everything is all right, you should see my entry screen. Okay. Absolutely. So indeed, um, like you said, this is a, this is a threat modeling uh, presentation. It's about medical devices. Um, I added a tagline when our lives depend on it, but it's also when our lives depend on IT in general. So it's, uh, um, I think it's a fundamental topic. It's important, obviously, that in general uh, we, we protect and we secure um, IT and digital projects in general. But when it comes to medical devices, uh, certainly now uh, it's, it's even more important. Um, so I wanted to uh, to bring the topic of, of okay how do we do this now um, since this is a hardware uh, I would say a seminar or webinar um, you you think we're going to like dissect and completely pull apart the, the hardware devices now I have to disappoint you we did not do that um, what we're actually doing and I'm going to explain what threat modeling is about threat modeling is really thinking about security well not only up front but also when when you're designing a new system and uh, in a conceptual way or in think up front of of aspects that can go wrong even before you actually develop or completely uh, deploy your systems um, so that's, and I'm going to explain how that works and how we can apply it specifically for medical devices and why even now it will become more important to do and to use threat modeling because of uh, compliance reasons. Um, so indeed, like you said, uh, you've already introduced me, so I'm going to skip this, but uh, today Alex Driesen took over my role of, of CEO in, at Torium. I'm uh, very happy with that. I congratulate him, him, him with that. I myself will focus now on, uh, on my role as CTO, which I already did, but I'm not going to dedicate much more time on. 
with that and everything was already said. So I'm going to skip this one. So I'm going to give a brief introduction to threat modeling. What is threat modeling and what's it useful for? Um, and going through the different stages of how to do it. Then I'm going to bring up FDA because medical devices, FDA, there is definitely a link. So I'm going to explain that if you would be new to that. And then I'm going to threat model a medical device. I'm also going to provide you with some pointers and resources. And in the end, there's room for, uh, for Q&A. Now, what is threat modeling? Threat modeling is really an activity to make sure up front while you're designing a system that you cover at least security requirements, but you also cover security design flaws. So what you see here is an overview of, of different stages that typically see in any development uh, life cycle. This can be a system uh, like a uh, software, but also can be hardware, an IoT device, a medical device. You always have some design activity, typically built software or systems will be built. Hopefully the results get tested and then you'll operate your device or your software in an operational environment. This can be sprints, this can be waterfall model, but these are the stages you will see and recognize in each, um, in each new system or in each new iteration of a system. And there are different activities that you should or consider uh, to apply to secure uh, security configuration flaws uh, to do and, and have configuration guidelines like injection flaws, which are typically test through security testing or co and provide coding guidelines to your developers or do source code reviews. But there's also design flaws. Aspects upfront that you need to consider while you're designing a system. Um, and design flaws is typically something it's very hard to, uh, to I would say, automatically test for that. There's no tools to do that. The, the main tool to discover, I would say, security design flaws is, is the tool between your ears and your brain and, and, and thinking upfront what can go wrong. So threat modeling, in essence, is the activity of identifying and typically aspects that can go wrong in your system. But also, how do you deal with that? How do you going to manage that? Because um, you all, there will always be flaws in your system, but there will be flaws that are much worse than others. So you need to have some, some kind of way to weigh them and to select what you're going to do to fix them or not in, a, in one of the next iterations. Sometimes it's also called architectural risk analysis. Uh, so, but that's, that's what threat modeling really is. Now, why would you do this? Typically threat modeling is to uh, for obviously, like I said, prevent security design flaws to identify and address the greatest risks in your system. But the biggest main benefit of doing threat modeling, and typically threat modeling is a group activity together with a development team, is to get your team on the same page in terms of security and get a shared vision together with your product owner, maybe possibly together with your customer, uh, together with the development team on, okay, what's the security posture of our product? What can we do? What should we do? Um, and what can we agree upon in our next sprint or our next development uh, stages? Uh, and that's the biggest main benefit of doing threat modeling while you're designing and developing your system. Um, once you've done it, the outcome of that will be a list of findings and aspects that, that, that potentially can go wrong. And it helps you pr to prioritize your developments, uh, but also to, uh, to justify any extra cost to secure your systems. Um, also, in, in general, it raises the awareness of the people that are involved. Um, and this might not only be developers, but also maybe your product owners that, that want to, uh, that, that need to have a better understanding of what uh, cybersecurity risks there might be, or even privacy risks there might be. And then last but not least, Threat modeling more and more becomes a requirement for due diligence, a compliance requirement. I'm going to cover FDA, but you also have GDPR and privacy by design is typically something that will require some kind of privacy threat modeling, but also IoT. And there is new IoT regulation upcoming in the US that specifically mentions threat modeling. And there's more and more uh, pressure that we see from our customer that come and ask us, can you provide us with training? Can you help us to threat model um, that, that require threat modeling as an activity as such? So how does it work? There's four stages. 
first of all, you have to understand, okay, what, what are you building? What are we building as a team? And you typically will create diagrams to do that uh, or to have some abstraction of what you're building. Then in a second stage, typically this is done during a work, like a workshop. This can be like people together, eh? if that's possible, respecting social distancing, obviously, or you can do it remotely around a virtual whiteboard. But you're going to identify threats and identify threats in a way that potentially what can go wrong to our system in a structural way. And there's different ways to do that. There's checklists. There's, uh, there's, you can involve a cybersecurity specialist. You can also use Stride. I'm going to explain Stride. That's one, one, one way of doing it, but it's not the sole way of doing it. Obviously, you don't only want to find out what can go wrong. You also want to understand, OK, what do we do? What's planned to mitigate these threats? Uh, so what are we going to do about these? And that's the third stage. And then the fourth stage is validating your, your threat modeling itself. Did we do a good enough job? Uh, can we improve next time of the outcome of the threat modeling uh, sprint that we've done here? And can we take that uh, into uh, actionable items as part of our development? Typically, certainly a bit more agile or, in, or even DevOps-like in, in a development or environments, um, this will be iterations in small steps. Uh, but you can also do this in bigger steps for, I would say, more formal uh, projects. And specifically also for medical devices, you might have this in a, in a, in a more formalized way as part of your development uh, stages. So I'm going to quickly scan over a couple of aspects here that we that are necessary to understand the demo later on. So diagramming, the first step is typically done through data flow diagrams. You can also use other diagrams. Um, what we're going to add here is trust boundaries and trust boundaries to a data flow diagram are to identify places or I would say surfaces in your environment or in, the, or in your system where potentially things might go wrong or where an attacker might intervene. So trust boundaries are something you specifically add to data flow diagrams to help or support threat modeling. And it's typically the place where there is a change in trust level. So for instance, uh, a user, an external user coming from the internet and accessing your system or a user from an internal network crossing a firewall to your internal other DMZ. To, uh, to activate or to perform a certain activity. So there's a change in trust level. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to shortly explain one example. Now this example is also going to be made available externally later on as a full, I would say what we call a whiteboard hacking survival guide. It provides a different stages and it uses this example to document each stage. And this is a data flow diagram of a fictional, so it doesn't exist, but a a web application called Jimao, get me an offer. It's a online insurance web application that provides the way for customers or clients to ask an insurance quote online. Agents can also do that on behalf of clients. The web application uses a configuration file, which you see at the top where there's some configuration uh, items loaded to connect to the backend uh, as a uh, CRM system, which in itself pulls from data from a CRM database. Uh, so you see with a very simple picture, you can already explain, I would say, a quite uh, sophisticated um, environment. Real data flow diagrams will be much more detailed, but this is to give you a little bit of an idea. But here you can also see there's three trust boundaries with the red dotted lines, trust boundary one, two, and three, where potentially aspects might go wrong where an attacker, maybe an external attacker from the internet or an internal attacker from the internal network might attack the systems involved. And it's on this place in a, in a data flow diagram where we can already reason, okay, what can go wrong? Uh, and the what can go wrong, identifying threats, there's one way of doing that is using Stride. Stride is not new, it's not something we invented. It was already introduced by a couple of very smart people at Microsoft in 1998. So it's more than 20 years old. Microsoft is using, still using it internally. And Stride is like a mnemonic, eh? like it's, it stands for the first letter, six letters of spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privileges. These are six categories of threats. Uh, which I'm not going to explain in detail here. We only have half an hour, but it gives you a little bit of an overview of a high level abstract checklist of aspects that can go wrong. 
And it's these threads that we're going to use to look at, okay, what are we going to do to secure against spoofing? For instance, in this case, you see a typical stride table or a thread table for the example that I provided, where as a mitigation, we have user, username password for our end users. But for instance, a vulnerability or a finding is we don't have two-factor authentication for our agent, uh, where, for instance, other mitigations are using TLS, um, but uh, or low bouncing web servers, but we don't have like audit trails or we don't look actions. So these are typically findings when it comes to repudiation. So you can use Stride together with a uh, with the, um, with this um, the, on the trust boundary specific on the trust boundary. Use Stride to create these kind of tables, and it provides in a in a very good a um, structural way to think of aspects that can go wrong. And anyone can do this once you have a little bit of an understanding of stride and trust boundaries. So that's how that works. Now, once you have that, and uh, once you use that, obviously you want to address these threats. And that's where stride is really good because there's mitigation, standard mitigation patterns for that, uh, being authentication, integrity checks, non-repudiation, for instance, like signing stuff, confidentiality, encrypting stuff, availability, authorization. These are six categories of mitigations that protect against stride. So typically, these are the kind of mitigation or control that you will consider already have designed into your solution. So once you've identified the threats, there's really four ways to act upon them. Either you redesign to eliminate your threats, you apply the standard mitigations, typically that's the, 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 the preferred way forward, or you might even invent new uh, mitigations. It's somewhat riskier specifically, uh, but, uh, but sometimes necessary. And the last step or the last possibility is to accept vulnerabilities. There are vulnerabilities in your design. You know them now and you can act upon them later, but at least you have some way of, um, of dealing with them. There is also some kind of like risk rating methodology that you can apply. Typically you do that by technical risk analysis. In this example, I've used the, uh, a couple of the vulnerabilities we had in the previous table in using an OWASP risk rating methodology. So quite easy to find back. Also in the resource later on, I will provide the links to do that. But it gives you a little bit of a, a feeling of what kind of threats and the related vulnerabilities are important and what are potentially less important to handle. So it gives you an example of, uh, it gives you a little bit of a, a guide. Okay, what can we do now? What can we do later? What can we accept? So this is really very quickly what threat modeling is about. Obviously, there's a lot of other aspects to that. You have to link it to your business impact and so on. But just to give you a little bit of an idea how that works. Now, why is this important? Why is it important to understand a little bit about threat modeling? That is because for medical devices, specifically in your, if you're in this business, you should prepare to understand what threat modeling is about because FDA will require it and, and quite soon. So FDA is the regulation authority, the US Food and Drugs Administration, that actually already requires a lot of medical device manufacturers to already proactively secure devices. So this is not new. And there is already a lot of regulation around this. And from the customers that we work with, they already do quite a lot of securing, proactively securing systems, uh, both hardware and even now more and more software, like in the form of apps and so on. Now, what's new though, and what's specifically new with regards to threat modeling is it's explicitly being referenced in the latest draft, which is already two years old, but we can expect it uh, to be in, I would say, become practice soon. There's a little bit of a delay because of COVID. Otherwise, we probably already had it uh, last year. But there is a, a pre-market submission requirement for the management of survival security in medical devices. So this is actually the guideline that is being used for medical device makers to, to document what they're going to do around security. And don't underestimate it. Typically, for any kind of device or software, this might be like up to 8,000 pages in terms of like documentation if it's a completely new system. Now, the main reasons for having this new updated regulation is it's not new, not a surprise, I think, for any, uh, anyone who listens to this. It's increased connectivity, increased digitization of healthcare, uh, in combination with higher threats. There's more threats. There's bigger impact uh, of, um, of using these devices when it goes wrong. 
and more incidents. Uh, so there's good reasons for FDA to become more strict in this. And also to let you understand that threat modeling is not the only part of this new regulation. Uh, what, what's new in this specific regulation, it's about designing trustworthy devices, not only when you design it, but also in an operational environment, when you operate this in a medical environment. It's also to prevent multi-patient attacks. And so it may be, so to put more emphasis on that. Uh, and there's also an, an, a notion of risk in there, in the specific regulation, that there's a tiered, a higher tiered approach, like you have to do more for higher cybersecurity uh, risk tier one systems versus tier two, uh, where it's lower uh, cybersecurity risk. So there's some kind of risk management included or built into this uh, regulation. Also, Certainly with supply chain uh, attacks that we've seen more and more in the last couple of years, cybersecurity bill of materials will become mandatory. And then system level threat models, what I have already referenced. That, so it's, it will become a mandatory submission as part of the pre-market submission of any new systems. So, okay, what is, how does this work? A demo on a medical device. So, um, so we didn't, I would say, decompose is an actual CT scanner, but I'm going to explain a, a system where a CAT scanner, so it's a scanner typically that scans you uh, to see potentially if something's wrong with you, connected in a, in a hospital, and typically the outcome of a CAT scanner is, is forwarded to other systems using, using standard uh, protocols like DECOM, it's digitalized images that are communicated over a network. Now, if you want to see and, and read more, we have released a white paper, it's not new, it's already released uh, last year around medical devices. Um, but I want to give you an overview how that, how that works. So what you see here is actually the CAT or the CT scanner on the left, uh, which uh, anytime when a new scan is being done forwarded through the PAX network, which is actually the, the network connecting everything here to a, like a storage this can be lo local this can also be then later on used in a cloud environment and where radiologists or physicians can actually view and look at the scans to see actually if you're healthy or not and that's that's how it works and there's a lot of systems that are around it that are connected to this so if we take the aspect that is important for us here so we have the ct scanner that forwards raw data to a modality workstation is actually the workstation that is used by the by the uh, by the operators to actually capture the data from the scanner itself and then forward to the pack server and then the radiologist typically has his or her own workstation um, so this is all ethernet uh, ethernet connected locally typically so if you provide that in a diagram, and this is like an, an, a simplified diagram, the scanner gets the scan instructions from the modality workstation. It forwards raw scanning data towards the workstation, forwarded through using DECOM as a protocol to the PAC server. And then the radiologist can use his workstation uh, using DICOM to the PAC server again. So this is actually how it works. Now, how do you start with this? Because there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So an example threat, and uh, this is not, I would say, luckily this is a, a threat that was identified by researchers. So we don't know actually if this has already been done in the wild, I, I assume not. Uh, but from their research, it is actually possible to inject forced evidence of lung cancer in, uh, in, uh, in, this, uh, in the, the, the packages going back and forth between the systems or even removing that uh, from those uh, from that uh, traffic. Um, there's the link to the research paper is here. They're actually using a very clever system of uh, machine learned uh, way of adding or removing these kind of like, um, uh, I would say giveaways in the, in, in, the, in the traffic. There is obviously the requirement that you need to have access to that traffic. Uh, and the way that these researchers did it is they used a specific hardware device that you see here on the, um, on the right, uh, some kind of like Pi connector that actually can on the fly modify this kind of traffic. Obviously, there's a couple of requirements that need to be in place. Uh, if it's standardized, non-encrypted traffic, then this is something that is possible. Um, but there's a lot of medical networks that are using, I would say, an, an encrypted traffic between these systems. 
Um, so it's a paper recently published. Um, obviously, this can be scary uh, to, uh, to see. Um, now, obviously, uh, this is one example thread. So how do you start with this? Uh, and, and this is just like an, uh, an example. Actually, you don't have to go as far as that. You can use and you should use the stride analysis um, to ask the main important questions. So between the modality workstation, which typically will capture the traffic that is scan from your CT scan and the pack server where it will be storing these images, using stride asks the right kind of questions towards a team and, 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 and makes them think, okay, how are we sure that it's actually the modality workstation talking to the pack server? How are we sure it's not possible to tamper with those endpoints? Is there some kind of way that we can see afterwards who or what has performed these kind of actions? Are we sure that nobody has access to this kind of like information without proper authorization? Is it possible to disrupt any of these systems? Can we perform actions on the workstation uh, that we should not have uh, actually the rights to perform? So these are simple, but very structurally uh, based questions that you can, as a designer or a developer of a system should be able to respond. If not, uh, obviously uh, you need to uh, go back to your drawing table and see, okay, how are we making sure that we, we, we cover this? And specifically, what you see here is the, the table. It's between the workstation and the pack server. The DICOM data is the traffic between the boat. And there, it's really focusing on tampering and information disclosure and denial of service, because that's which is important on traffic between systems. And what is highlighted here, can we manipulate data? Can we intercept the data? Because if that is true, it's kind of like uh, what I would call exotic threats uh, would potentially be possible. But if we cover the main basic question, how do we have some kind of proper way to prevent manipulation or interception or even detect if, if you don't have the prevention part, then you should be safe against these kind of threats. Um, and that's the whole idea. And that's the whole way of actually using threat modeling on any kind of device. And this is a medical device. We can use it on any other medical device or any other system. And it allows, it's, it's not I would say it's not rocket science. It's a very structured way of doing a technical risk analysis together with the team. Uh, and that's how it works. So to give you also a little bit more details, I've provided you with an example of how threat modeling is being done. Uh, I've, uh, I will share the slides uh, later on so you can download them. Uh, we have the whiteboard hacking survival guide, which explains the different steps, which you can download directly. We have the white paper, which explains in much more detail what we've done. And we've done this not only ourselves, but also with a specific uh, medical security vendor and also with, with somebody who actually uses in the medical sector. So it's not only us, it's also with people from the practice. Uh, and then as an extra threat modeling resource, I'm adding the OWASP threat modeling playbook. It's something that we've developed and donated to OWASP as a playbook to start threat modeling as a practice within your organization, which uh, we assume might be very um, useful when you need to start doing threat modeling. So that is in a nutshell what threat modeling is and how threat modeling might or should be valuable and even might become uh, important and uh, required for any pro any medical device. So with that, I think I'm about at 30 minutes and I'm opening it up for any questions you might have. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, we have one question from the audience. What device or tools are you using for TM, threat modeling? So what kind of uh, device or tools are we using for threat modeling? Um, there's two answers here. There's uh, not a lot and potentially a lot. Uh, the most important tool for, for threat modeling is a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. uh, and why am I saying this? Because it's, it's the best medium to support free format thinking on uh, threats and, and countermeasures. Uh, and we see in practice that it, that's the best tool uh, to do threat modeling. And obviously uh, now with remote working, you have any kind of like whiteboard 
white virtual whiteboards like Miro, like even whiteboards in Teams and so on. Even have like digital whiteboards that you can use and share remotely. Um, so that's, that's, I would say, the basic, and you should start with that potentially. But there's also other tools. Uh, so do you have Microsoft Threat Modeling tool, which is a tool which helps you to create diagrams and which does some basic analysis of what you, of your diagram. It's, uh, it's not open source, but it's free. Um, so it, it's some, in, in, I would say, some kind of tool that you could consider to do this. Um, obviously, any kind of diagramming tool like diagram.net or draw.io, how, how, what it was called before, is, is useful as well. Then you also have some, uh, I would say, commercial threat modeling tools like risk, uh, like Iris Risk, uh, like Threat Modeler. Um, there's, there's a couple of them. Um, and they're becoming more and more in use, I see, specifically in organizations that have to, do, have to do a lot of threat modeling. But what's important, and that's also what we've explained in the threat modeling playbook, is make sure you first have an understanding of what you're doing. Okay? Make sure you train the people that are going to do threat modeling that they know what they're doing. Make sure you build it in, in your processes, that you link it to your risk management process. And then once you have that, you can start off I would say automating this with the uh, toolings. And that also matches a little bit the, the maturity levels that, for instance, we have in OWASP SUM and the Software Assurance Maturity Model, which has some kind of levels of maturity of threat modeling. And threat modeling level one is very basic, just at home do it and make sure you have some persistence of doing of your, of your threat model. Level two is have some process that matches your way of working. And level three only is make sure you have some tooling to support that. And to automate that and to make it more efficient. So I hope that uh, that answers your question. I don't hear your question. Sorry, uh, I was on mute. There's one more question, Sebastian. Is there any aspect that we should look at specifically for medical devices that are not so much important to other applications or other devices? That, that's a good question. Uh, yes. Um, obviously, medical devices are, um, uh, are once deployed, they will have, they will have cybersecurity issues. So, so one aspect you should definitely have or should consider is to have a secure update mechanism uh, of, your, of your system. And uh, this is already hard for, I would say, basic devices like IoT devices, for medical devices, even more important. Now, there is a myth uh, that, uh, that you cannot update or should not update a medical device because it somehow would invalidate uh, the FDA, uh, I would say, um, regulations around that. That's, that's not true. Actually, FDA has, uh, has debunked that, that myth already for a couple of years. You can and should actually update a medical device. Obviously, you need to involve your end users. There has to be a process around this. Um, and you need, to, uh, you need to make sure it's, it's done in a proper way and in a secure way. Um, but that is, I think, one of the more critical aspects of a medical device and any, I would say, remote device that is in the field. Uh, because sooner or later, there will be issues. Uh, because of the whole supply chain that comes with it. And there will be known vulnerabilities, so you need to have some kind of update mechanism. And that is, a, a, I would say, one of the, the most important security considerations uh, or security countermeasures to have for a medical device. All right. Uh, I have one question from my side. Uh, well, uh, I do not know what are the protocols but uh, for medical devices, but would you recommend uh, hospitals or you know locations where they use medical devices to switch from DICOM to any other protocol? Or would you say DICOM is the best suited for medical device equipments? For, I'll well, share the, for, for, for imaging system, it's, it's, the, it's the de facto standard. So it's, uh, it's, it's not something you could easily switch, uh, I would say, to, towards other, other protocols. Um, now, what I would uh, suggest uh, in general, I would say, for uh, these kind of, I would say, um, devices and medical devices, or in, even also in other environments where you have more, I would say, other protocols in use than, I would say, standardized protocols that are, I would say, used a lot in, uh, I would say, in public networks, is to segment it off 
of, I would say, normal, I would say, the office networks uh, and, and I would say yeah. normal uh, 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 local networks within, within hospital or other systems. Um, now that's easily that's easily said. Uh, it's in practice, in a lot of situations, it's not that uh, not that easy. Um, but segmentation, specifically for older models that have older protocols, and because DICOM is more or less standardized, is known. But there's a lot of esoteric protocols, specifically also by other older medical, but also for by older older devices that use non-standard proprietary protocols. And then you're in trouble. So uh, specifically, it's more if it's more proprietary and less known, uh, I would say the first step to do is make sure you segment it, segment the hell out of it, so that it's not reachable through any, I would say, normal means from a normal network, or specifically, certainly not from an external network. Understood. Fair enough. Any other questions, audience? All right, uh, Sebastian. All right, I have um, I have just one more to, I have one more slide, just a pitch. I know you have some pitches as well. So, um, so we have some trainings, uh, a couple of trainings online by Torin. We've been invited by Craft. I'm very happy to also announce that we've been selected for Black Hat training again, uh, and we'll also be giving, giving training as part of 44Con and maybe soon on hardware.io as well. Uh, so if you want to get in touch, uh, send me an email. I do respond to email. Sometimes it might be a little bit slower, but I do respond to the email. If you also want to find out more, we have a threat modeling inside a newsletter where we regular, regularly have guest writers writing on threat modeling and other interesting content. So I suggest that you uh, subscribe to that as well. Uh, so with that, for me, stay safe and healthy. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh... Friends, uh, do join us for our upcoming webinar on the 20th of April. Uh, it is exploring uh, hunting keys in SAMA 5 devices. Uh, so thank you so much and stay safe until then. Bye.